Now, it seems a little strange to consider frogs and peonies. After all, there's quite a difference, wouldn't you say? I think we can go out and tell a frog from a peony. Or can we? <clears throat> it seems easy enough, and we should be able to do that, but the question still remains. It's possible that the frogs and peonies can become blurred. What we think is a peony is a frog. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we've come here today, first of all, seeking a blessing. Second of all, understanding. And third, how to handle the present, how to handle the now, to separate frogs and peonies. Please be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. It's <clears throat> Wednesday, January 15, 1919. Now, it's a kind of a warm day for winter in Boston. You would call it shirt sleeve weather. And if you weren't working, you would probably take advantage of it and make a stroll through northern Boston. Maybe you'd go shopping. But maybe you had to work. But it was lunchtime, it was just a little past noon. And so you would be enjoying the breeze, the warmth, as you ate your lunch. And you'd be looking out over the harbor. The sea is just a ways from you. And as you watch the waves and eat your lunch, you notice something else in the area. Something relatively new, it's painted. It's a large storage tank, 50 feet high and 40 feet across. And you may be puzzled, what's in that large tank? Well, that would soon be divulged in a matter of minutes. You see, time was becoming limited. Let's consider two things, something we all have, something we all use, time and words. So we have a clock and we have a dictionary. You and I use those items regularly. Whether we are rich, poor, young or old, slave or free, tall or short, we all have time. And because we seem to feel we have an abundance of time and words, we feel we can use them as we see fit. That may not be the case. I'm sharing with you that is not the case. Ecclesiastes 3 one through eight, we're familiar with this. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant 
and a time to uproot, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to tear down, and a time to build, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate a time for war, and a time for peace. My thoughts on this are concerned about some of the statements in Ecclesiastes. One of them that bothers me very much is a time to throw away. Throw away time and our words. Time is a measure of life, and words are a measure of character. How we say it, when we say it, and how we use our time is extremely important. Proverbs 25, 11, like apples of gold and settings of silver, is a rule rightly given. King James Version indicates its words fitly spoken. Time and words are like bookends holding the library of life together. And for that reason, they will be judged. Child Guidance 123. Time is a precious treasure, a trust from God. Every human being must give an account of how they use their time. The value of time is beyond computation. Time squandered can never be recovered. I look back on my youth and I can say I squandered a lot of time. When you're in your teens you think that 80 years is a long ways away. Funny how it picks up speed after you get married and start a family. And suddenly you find that your children are grown and they're gone from home. Matthew 12, 37. By your words you will be acquitted. And by your words you will be condemned. It's a very, very thoughtful statement. And I wonder... Have we considered our time and considered our words? You either help somebody toward heaven or you push them away. There's a letter here from Ellen White. I'm going to share a part of it with you. She wrote it to W.W. W. Prescott in 1894. I'll try to say it succinctly. I want you to listen carefully. The time will come when we shall be called to stand before kings, rulers, magistrates, powers, in vindication of the truth. Notice she didn't say it could come. She said it will come. 
then it will be a surprise to those who witness to learn that their positions, their words, their very expressions made in a careless manner or thoughtless way when it had thought to be, re let's see, a thoughtless way when attacking error or advancing truth, expressions they had not thought would be remembered will be reproduced and they will be confronted with them. And the enemies will have an advantage and put their own construction on those words that were spoken inadvisedly. Let's talk about frogs. Frogs are mentioned in three books of the Bible. Exodus, Psalms, and Revelation. Exodus 8. I find this one slightly humorous. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. If you had a million frogs, you now got two million. I kind of think about them standing there, and pretty soon they have four million. Six million. Did you notice they can produce the frogs? They can't get rid of them. Let's go further with Psalms 105.30. hard to uh, see that. Their land uh, teemed with frogs and it was in their, it's kind of cut off, but it's in their bedrooms, it was in their kitchen, and there were frogs everywhere. Frogs in the bedroom. Frogs in the kitchen. Frogs on the radio. Frogs on social media. I guess we've stepped forward a few thousand years. What am I saying? The land that you live in today is full of frogs. Revelation 16, 13. I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Frogs in our time? Yes. That's the problem. Frogs are covering the land, they're covering your kitchen, they're covering your living room, and mine also. We live in a time of frogs, but we get used to them. We start singing with them. I said earlier this morning, I noticed sometimes when I was out hiking, I enjoyed listening to the frogs chirp, but I could never find them. Every time I got close, they quit. These frogs don't quit. Our problem is we may not recognize them as what they are. Well, with frogs at our doorstep, let's take a little look. I am going to share with you eight different things that I consider frogs. I'm not going to expound on them. I want you to think it over because if I expound, I do one of two things, support or deny. That's not for me here to do today. Frogs. One, the replacement theory. Two, the U.S. is moving toward socialism. Three, the government is raising gas prices to forces into electric vehicles. Four, 
The GOP plans to steal the next election. Five. Older people think young people are lazy. Six, that COVID-19 is a conspiracy of the government. Seven, white men are the biggest threat to women's liberty and a citizen's right to vote. Perhaps you heard these statements. And if you have heard them, perhaps you have spoken them with similar words, if not the same. But when you listen to these ideas, notice they create victims. And victims create hate. And we have enough hate to destroy this nation. Even former President Clinton said recently, I don't know if this country's got 20 years before they'll throw away their democracy. We're not going to set a timeline on anything. But the point is, some of those who are in the higher echelon of government in the past, and probably current, see a drift of this nation toward not socialism, but totalitarianism. That's possible. But how could we get to that point is the question. Well, I've used this so often, I can't quit using it. I hope you don't think this is a frog. Education 228. At the same time, anarchy is seeking to sweep away all law, not only divine but human, centralizing of wealth and power to the vast combination for enriching the few at the expense of the many. The con, uh, con, con oh boy, that line comes through very good. <laughs> the combinations of power class for the defense of their interests and the claims of the spirit of unrest, of riot and bloodshed, the worldwide dissemination of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution, are but tending toward to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. I have said it so many times, I hope you have taken this time to study Education 227, 228. It's the only time that the French Revolution is mentioned in future tense, not past. My friends, we have enough hate within our own country. We're moving toward a harvest because we have planted a crop of hate. We've done it a little at a time, but we've done it through the idea that we are victims. Victims get angry and they create hate. The crop has been planted and I assure you there will be a harvest. John looked up at the tank. He had been caulking it for approximately 10 days. When the weather was hot, he noticed that the tank rumbled like it was alive. The heat seemed to make the liquid expand in the tank and the noise was frightening. He didn't enjoy doing his job as he was in the presence of that tank. What was in the tank groaned like an animal, and it leaked at the seams and at the rivet heads. 
The brown liquid ran down the outside of the tank and puddled on the ground. Cold weather didn't seem to help very much as the liquid never froze. It only leaked at a slower pace. Now they would offload this liquid from ships out at the sea and they would pump new liquid in to fill the tank. And when the liquid came from the boats into the tank, it was warm. And then it mixed with the cold in the tank and the rumbling got louder. The noise almost became deafening. But now, as John was looking things over, he realized that 50-foot tank had 48 feet of liquid in it. It's almost full. Just a little room for expansion, perhaps. And the contents weighed 26 million pounds. But John had done his job. It's all he could do. He could press on the caulking and watch the liquid come out through the caulking and puddle on the end of his finger. Press the caulking, out came the liquid. But John had done his job the best he could do. He didn't have time to do any more. We are living in a very troublous time. I think we all recognize it. I know I've talked to people who do not seem to particularly go to church, and they're getting concerned. And so my question is, are we getting concerned? Now, I don't tell you these things to create fear. I tell you these things so that you prepare. Once you recognize some of the problems, I hope that it changes your way of looking at the times in which you're living and your relationship to Jesus Christ. Otherwise, my talk is a waste of time. Let's go to some problems, and then we can go to the peonies. Number one is drought. They say that Southwest United States is in a drought that hasn't been in the last 1,200 years. Did you know that in Chile, they are taking tanks out to tanker trucks out to the rural areas because Chile, Chile is running out of water. Now, in the early part of May in California, around Lake Tahoe, you should find 5.5 feet of snow. This year, they found 2.5 inches. Lake Powell has reached almost a breaking point without them taking water from Flaming Gorge. The turbines in Lake Powell at Glen Canyon Dam would quit. They're not sending that water they get from Flaming Gorge south to Lake Mead. They're keeping it at Lake Powell. And Lake Powell right now is at 27% of capacity. It's like one fellow said, 
taking water from one reservoir and putting it into another is like burning your furniture to keep warm. This is the one that really intrigues me, but I'll go back here. Notice the drought. Notice the lack of electricity. Notice they're trying to get us into electrical vehicles. Something's colliding. Something isn't fitting. Food supply, this is the one I really take notice. Just yesterday I found out that the Po River in northern Italy is running at lower than ever before and they expect, and this is the breadbasket for Italy, they expect their crop will be 20 to 40 percent less than normal. Food is becoming a little more difficult. Planting, have you noticed the storms in the central United States? Planting is getting very difficult. They're now concerned here in our part of the country about the berry crop. It's being destroyed by too much water. And so many countries are saying, oh no, we are not going to export our grain. We're keeping it within our own boundaries. Well, that sounds pretty good. Except if you're on the other side of the boundary and you're hungry. That can get downright angry, couldn't it? And what if, just what if, they saved all the grain and kept it in their own country and still found out they were short of feeding. At some point, there's going to be violence. Even the United Nations said they're very concerned about 2023. Jimmy Dimon, the president of J.P. Morgan Chase, puts it this way. There is an economic storm coming. Yes, there is. Even if gas dropped tomorrow, the damage that the inflation has done will not be gone. It will remain. I've got some gas over at a Safeway here about four or five days ago. I reached down to get my receipt and I looked at the receipt and it wasn't mine. It made me feel better because it said $115. There was just one problem on that receipt that I felt very concerned about. It said Visa credit. Somebody is having a problem with cash flow. And they push the problem down the road, you know, the proverbial kick the can, by putting in a credit card. I don't know how far the 115 will take them. That's a lot of money. Diamond is saying that people, as he sees it, have six months, less than a year, and they will use up all of their savings. You know, you only have two choices. You can drain your savings, or you can charge it. Either way is painful. Marge and I were really hoping, we love to travel, we were hoping we could go to Wyoming for about a week out there and back. We weren't going to go, we weren't going to go to Yellowstone, which is another interesting thing. We did go to Yellowstone last September. The very roads that we ro drove into Yellowstone is now destroyed. I tell you true, 
we never even considered that a possibility when we were in Gardner, Montana. Now, I've shared this with you many times. I hope something really begins to stick, okay? Private debt, we've got the government out of it. Private debt, that's you and me, have reached $15.84 trillion of debt. Private debt, $15.84 trillion. Dollars. And how much is a trillion dollars? It is a stack of $1,000 bills, 69 miles high. Times that by 15.84. It's a lot of miles. Let's take an example. Her name is Linda. She lives in Memphis, Tennessee. Now, the article did not tell me all the background. I can only tell you what I know. In April, she put her heating, water, and electric bill on a credit card. Her bill was $864. It's a lot of money. I don't know if it's a month or two months. It certainly can't be more. Now, before she could get much damage to the credit card, the debt for her had reached $22,000 on the credit card. Linda makes $39,000 a year. We're going backwards. The standard monthly payment for a car now is $712. You know, that can buy a loaf of bread. It's dangerous. Our debt is extremely dangerous. Maybe we haven't looked at it. Well, now I've given you some frogs. If you have played with these frogs, I hope you'll put them down. You have done nothing, absolutely nothing, to advance the cause of your God by making statements along this line. It's time now to gather the peonies. So let's look at the peonies. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. Question. What are you seeking? The majority of the world is seeking all they can get, all the wealth they can bestow. What are we seeking? Next. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. What have you been saying to advance the kingdom of your Lord? Have you said something that will build and grow, that people will reach to him? Or have you played the victim? and said, in effect, we're all victims, therefore we will hate. Next. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything else be, beyond this comes from the evil one. Keep your statements simple, short, compact. Yes or no. You don't have to go into great details. As soon as you go into great details, you're wandering on a different trail. Watch carefully your words. Next. Rather of yourself, 
The line goes through it. At any rate, close yourself for the Lord Jesus Christ is what he's saying. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And not think about to gravi uh, gratify the desires of the flesh. What's that? It's very simple. How do you find this verse? Easy. It says, get dressed. Look in your closet and see what you have. Now, this is no slight on the ladies, but I know they're kind of noted for this. What will I wear today? You know? They have a lot of good choices. The guy's got this one Sabbath suit. He doesn't have a problem. And maybe he has a couple shirts, a few ties. What will I wear today? I'll tell you what you wear. Ladies and gentlemen, in that closet, there is one garment and one only. Put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Next, Ephesians 4, 13. Until we reach the unity in the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, become mature, attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. How full do you want to be? Have you asked yourself, have I asked myself, how full of Christ do I want to be? Answer, how empty do I want to be so that I may fill, be filled as I should be? Too often, we don't want to empty. Therefore, if it's three quarters full, all you're going to get is a quarter of Christ. I hope we're not satisfied with that amount. Colossians 1.27 To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his mystery, which is in Christ in you, the hope of glory. It goes back to that fullness. Do you show the glory of your Redeemer? Do I? Matthew 5.37 Okay, I think, oh Isaiah, that's what I want. Isaiah 32.2 I love this. And a man shall be a hiding place from the wind and a covert from the trump tempest, as rivers of water of a dry place, as a shadow of a great rock within a weary land. We talked about drought. Let's talk about a solution. I think that man, M, should be capitalized, and I believe that we need to get in the shadow of that rock. There's a place called Ayers Rock in central Australia. Australia is exceedingly flat. And western Australia is exceedingly dry. And I can imagine in the times past in exploration that they found Ayers Rock and after a long, hot day, sat in its shadow. <clears throat> Next point. How much of a shadow are you and I? If we have found the rock, can we guide others to the rock? It sounded like a machine gun fire as the tank swayed, buckled, and came apart. Rivets snapped like bullets, and the sides buckled, and the liquid roared from the container and roared toward the city streets. Fifteen-foot wall coming at the speed of 35 miles an hour. Buildings crumbled. 
Some were moved off their foundations. People were crushed, drowned. 21 people died and 150 were injured. When they were engulfed by 2 million 300,000 gallons of molasses. Time for them had run out. And time for us is moving the same way. We haven't got time to chirp. We have time to gather for the peonies. We haven't got time to divide the church or the nation. We have time to nestle ourselves in the peonies. We only have time to become like our Lord. No more, no less. You see, time is running out. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Gracious Lord, we have looked at the frogs. We don't want them. They have not helped anyone. We may even have spoken them. No, forgive us for that. And Lord, we've looked at the current situation and we recognize that something far bigger than we've ever seen in our lifetime is happening. And we only have one place to go. And that is to the rock Christ Jesus and that is to immerse ourselves in his character and his likeness. And we haven't got time to say unadvisable words. We have time only to speak your spirit. And so now we pray, as we look these things over, that we will draw close to you, hold you firm, and that we will be a blessing moving the kingdom of God forward. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.